The first genocide trial has begun in Rwanda. In the outbreak of ethnic violence in Borneo. The Soviet republics of Armenia and Azerbaijan have accused each other of launching military attacks. Across There's been more border. fighting in the Liberian capital, Monrovia. There are reports the that The biggest so-called ethnic cleansing operation seen in Bosnia for more than two years. There are at least twice as many conflicts now as there were at the height of the Cold War. Today's wars are most likely to frown on global hotspots of poverty and deprivation. In places on our planet where natural resources can no longer support an increasing population. In this edition of Earth Report, we examine the links between overstretched ecosystems and social instability and point to where impoverishment of the environment is an unrecognized cause of tension and conflict around the world. For half a century, global security existed in the equal and opposing force of two world superpowers. Throughout the Cold War era, the populations of East and West learned to live under the shadow of nuclear annihilation. But the long-feared Armageddon never happened. When it came, the nuclear nightmare was not a bomb, but an accident. Design flaws and poor safety procedures meant the Soviet power station at Chernobyl in the Ukraine was a time bomb. International security was no longer a simple question of military might. As radioactive fallout drifted beyond Soviet borders, crossing Europe on westerly winds, Chernobyl became an international disaster. And for once, there could be no cover-up. Across the Eastern Bloc, authorities were struggling to keep the lid on other problems. Mass protests, born out of discontent, toppled the communist regimes of Eastern Europe, one by one. The Soviet Union soon followed. A new world order had arrived. No longer would the superpowers fight proxy wars. But as the Cold War thawed, the threats to global security did not melt away. If anything, they have fragmented and multiplied. There are growing fears about who control the Soviet Union's huge nuclear arsenal. Germany has expressed concern that some of the breakaway republics could become nuclear powers in their own right. Today, there are estimated to be twice as many major armed conflicts every year as there were at the height of the Cold War and war itself has changed. Most conflicts are fought within rather than between nations. Troops are more likely to be irregulars than professional soldiers. And civilians, often deliberately targeted, are being killed and displaced as never before. Most of the new conflicts are local conflicts, internal conflicts, more than state-to-state -state conflicts. It's not solely among countries, but it's within countries, among communities, or between different uh, uh, interest groups. So it is a conflict of interest. It could be countryside versus cities, agriculture versus industry, farmers versus, versus industrialists. So it's, it's very much true that internal conflicts are a reality. And as we wage war on each other, there's a parallel trend. Our systematic war against nature and natural resources. Forests are dwindling. Fish stocks are disappearing. And we are losing six million hectares of farmland a year. Climate change and pollution are adding further pressures. And even as nature retreats, it has to support ever more people. There are more than twice as many people today as there were in 1950. 
and human numbers are anticipated to grow by half as many again, another three billion, in the next three decades. So how is pressure on resources feeding tension and conflict around the world? If uh, you make your neighbor the beggar of your well-being, the neighbor will not be very happy. This is a basis for tensions and for these reasons we have a lot to do also to be available in this field. According to the research that has been developed, there is no evidence that environment has still now been the sole cause of conflicts, but it is evident and understood by most that environmental degradation and, co and competition for scarce resources can be a contributing factor in the process of destabilization. Long before the thaw in east-west relations, the icy waters of the North Atlantic became the setting for a Cold War of a different kind. The opponents were both NATO allies. At stake, the natural riches of the deep. Iceland is a small island nation with very few resources. Its climate and soil support little in the way of crops and even fewer trees. It has barely any mineral deposits. And yet, it's a wealthy nation. And the reason is this, the cod. Iceland's fishing industry accounts for 70% of its export earnings. Since the very beginnings of distant water fishing, Icelandic seas had been a magnet to the trawler fleets of other nations, in particular the UK. But during the 1950s, catches had begun to fall. In 1958, Iceland declared a territorial limit of 12 nautical miles and pushed out the foreign trawlers. Throughout the 60s, the catches kept on dropping. Only too aware of Iceland's dependence on the sea, its authorities needed to act. In 1972, they extended the exclusive fishing limit to 50 nautical miles, and this time, they were ready to enforce it. The Icelandic Navy played a dangerous game of cat and mouse with British trawlers. Outraged, the UK sent in the Royal Navy to protect its fishing fleet. But with their very survival at stake, the Icelanders didn't back down. The final chapter in what had become dubbed the Cod War came in 1976, when Iceland extended its territorial waters again to 200 miles. This time, NATO was brought in to broker a peace deal. Apart from some damaged warships, the main casualties in the Cod War were job losses in the UK's fishing industry and dented national pride. Victorious and in charge of its seas once again, Iceland set about introducing strict controls on when and where fish could be caught. Nearly 30 years on, Iceland's hardline stance looks far-sighted. The traditional British dish of cod and chips has been virtually priced off the menu. Meanwhile, the Icelandic cod fishery is the only one in the North Atlantic where stocks are considered to be at sustainable levels. While wealthy nations may clash over shared resources, serious conflicts have always been avoided. But around the world, international tension is simmering over diminishing fish stocks. At least 12 of the world's major fishing grounds are seriously depleted and 90% of the large species are now fished out. Global fish catchers would need to double to fully meet growing human demand. Critics of environment and security tend to say that it's not the environment that triggers the wars, uh, and I think that's right. But uh, in fact, environment can raise social tensions, it can increase competition over scarce resources, and under a combination of circumstances that can lead to conflict. It was that combination of circumstances which came together in a small Central African country in 1994.
Rwanda. The lush beauty of the country belies the traumas of its recent history and the fierce tensions between the two main ethnic groups that make up the population, the majority Hutus and the minority Tutsis. Since the 1950s, each group had been battling for political supremacy in a series of violent clashes in which thousands were massacred or displaced. But at the same time, there were other problems. Rwanda's population more than tripled between 1948 and 1992, making it the most densely populated country in Africa. There wasn't enough land to go round. While small numbers of wealthier families owned the most productive farms, huge numbers of poor families ended up with land holdings too small or too steep to produce enough to eat. Such was the pressure to grow food on every available piece of land, soils became exhausted, especially on the mountainsides. By the 1990s, two-thirds of the population were suffering from chronic hunger. Meanwhile, civil war had displaced one million people. With famine looming, the country was at boiling point. When civil war broke out again in the spring of 1994, Hutu extremists used it as a pretext to unleash a mass slaughter, systematically killing almost a million Tutsis and moderate Hutus. The rate of killing was greater than the Nazis managed during the Holocaust. We did a very interesting case study in Rwanda looking at the origins of the genocide in 1994. And in fact we found that the, uh, there was a perfect correlation between those parts of the countries that were most environmentally degraded and the areas where conflict originated. Now, that's not to say that environment is the cause of the Rwanda genocide, but it's certainly a contributing factor. So instead of spending hundreds of billions of dollars on high-tech weaponry, shouldn't security agencies be doing more to tackle a deteriorating global environment? International agencies have recently made some unexpected alliances, which may signal a change of attitude. Amazingly enough, is the first time that an environment agency, a security agency, and a development agency have cooperated around the theme of environment and security. The United Nations Environment Programme and the United Nations Development Programme are working on a joint project with two bastions of international security, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and NATO. NATO has given Earth Report the following statement. The ENVSEC initiative provides an excellent framework for expanding our cooperation. By putting our forces together, the four organizations, UNEP, UNDP, OSCE, and NATO, will have a much greater impact on security. Each organization, as well as the countries involved, will benefit. The result of this partnership is the Environment and Security Initiative, known as ENVSEC. It's working on a pilot project in Central Asia and Southeastern Europe, a region where resource scarcity, ethnic tension, and weak civil society have combined all too frequently to spark off conflict. In the middle of ENVSEC's pilot area is possibly the single biggest man-made environmental catastrophe on the planet. This desert, between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, used to be a sea. Not millions of years ago, or even hundreds. Just 30 years ago, this was the Aral Sea, then the fourth largest inland sea in the world. The Aral's fate was sealed by the Soviet leader, Leonid Brezhnev. He was determined to turn the arid lands of Central Asia into vast cotton and rice plantations. But farming the desert would require huge quantities of chemicals and water. 
two rivers feeding the sea were diverted for irrigation. It was like turning off a tap. Since 1970, the sea has halved in depth and lost 90% of its volume. Lugun in northern Kazakhstan used to be a fishing village. Today, the sea is 30 kilometers away. 70-year-old Magmet was a fisherman almost all his working life before becoming manager of the local fish processing plant. All this area used to be sea, where we are standing right now. There were more than 30 types of fish in the Aral Sea. After the sea has gone, of course the situation is bad. Those who have a job are lucky, others are forced to borrow money from each other. The fishing industry used to employ 60,000 people. The wind is laden with toxic dust, whipped up off the dried out seabed. The dust is contaminated with the pesticides, which drained into the sea from the cotton and rice plantations. When it's a windy day, this area is full of dust. Pupils cannot breathe this type of air. The chemicals have also seeped into the rivers that supply drinking water. Levels of anemia are the highest in the world. The rates of cancer, as well as thyroid, kidney and liver diseases, are alarmingly high. Babies and children are the most vulnerable. The child mortality rate is higher than anywhere in the former Soviet Union. Since the sea shrunk, children are different nowadays. They are smaller compared to the children before. They were healthier. Children today get ill more often. What can I say? We are sitting in the middle of sandstorms and salt. We hope that in the end everything will be okay and the Aral Sea will come back. Allah knows that for sure. We have no industry now, so people are poorer than before. There is no money to buy food and nowhere to buy it. The sea has gone, so there are no fish and nothing to trade with, which is why we are seeing malnutrition. Few see a future here. Most have left in search of better prospects. Before, there were 800 children in the school, but because of the bad environmental conditions, many families have moved away, and now there are only 300 children left. More than 100,000 people have already migrated from the region, adding to tensions elsewhere. That's why we created this, uh, this partnership with OSC, uh, and partly with UNEP, because displacement or the migration of the people from the lands which is very degraded, degraded from, the, from the environmental point of view, and they create a new problem. The Aral has yet to become a conflict zone, but its environmental problems are mirrored in other parts of Central Asia. Well, the Fregana Valley is, is often thought of as a, as a potential hotspot, uh, an explosive point, just because there's such a combination of overuse of resources, overuse of pesticides, uh, public health problems, uh, soil erosion and, and the rest. And there has been some instability there, but it's one of these powder kegs that could possibly explode unless environmental action is taken very quickly. Central Asia. Uh, uh, is a region where you have had conflicts already uh, when it's up to the water. And of course, when 70% of the water is used for irrigation, it also uh, means uh, that there uh, is uh, not uh, enough water. And uh, the result is the Aral Sea. 
The Aral catastrophe is a legacy of a previous political system. But there has been little or no improvement since the breakup of the Soviet Union. Many experts believe democracy is a key factor in reversing the damage and stabilizing the region. We should start with improving, I would say, the governance of those countries. Better planning, taking environmental concerns, integrate them to the other sectoral policy, and maybe to raise the awareness of the decision maker or policy makers, because they are the, those who take the decision, and part of them also they implement the decision. Apart from creating a framework, as I was saying previously, there has been no political commitment and political capacity among the five countries of the region to truly cooperate in the management of the water resources. So the problem was, de facto, not resolved. And this is a major issue that MSEC has identified as a problem, the lack of political commitment and political capability. The outlook for the Aral Sea is bleak. But in the Balkans, there are signs that environmental cooperation could help heal communities scarred by war. 20,000 people fled over one part of the border this weekend after Serbian attacks on northern Bosnian villages. The river Sava is the border of Croatia and northern Bosnia. There is one bridge still standing at Bozanski Broad. Three weeks ago, 20,000 people crossed it in convoy. There could be thousands more tomorrow, escaping from towns and villages where there's daily fighting. They are desperate to find any route out. Throughout the 90s, the Yugoslav Republic tore itself apart in a series of bitter and bloody wars. The Sava River on the border between Croatia and Bosnia was the scene of fierce fighting and ethnic cleansing. The uh, Sava River in the former time was national river of former Yugoslavia. Sava River in the last decade was the river of conflicts. The Bosnian Serbs have started a massive expulsion of Croats from land they control in northern Bosnia. In what the United Nations has called a final ethnic cleansing of the region, hundreds are being forced out of the Bosnian Serb stronghold of Banja Luka. There are 260 rivers across borders between nations, not necessarily seeing wars between nations, but you can definitely see tension between people, ethnic groups, clashes, that kind of violence. The new government in these last and two and a half years, we have conflict against cooperation, against cooperation, conflict and on the other side international cooperation, conflict or security, conflict or multilateral uh, agreements. We choose no conflicts again. We choose environmental security as the process to go towards European Union and to go towards uh, sustainable development. Because the southeastern European region is, was with a lot of conflicts and we don't want, the people of Serbia don't want to see conflicts again. Now with uh, OECE involved after that UNEP and now UNDP, we are having the process of Sava River cooperation. Four countries are contributing with developing the cooperation on Sava River. It's uh, going very well and it, it was the first cooperation in the region and it was on environmental issues. I think it's very important for people to understand, first of all, that there are environmental roots to conflict, but also that, in fact, cooperation around environmental management is a way of lowering social tensions and a way of avoiding conflict. And in fact, among the solutions that are there, that are realistic, environmental cooperation is probably one of the cheapest and most accessible. Environment ministry is very much connected with security because if you would like to have a safe and secure life you have to have a safe water you have to have safe food you have to have clean air in that respect you have to involve the ministry of environment in the process